everybody, and welcome to episode 24 of my commission painting vlog. This is the end of June of 2017. And it hasn't been an overly busy month in terms of painting. Uh, if, if we're just talking about pure quantities of miniatures painted, but it has been an interesting month of painting. Uh, and so why don't we kind of get right to it? So first up, as I mentioned uh, last month, I was doing some more uh, pinups. So really these are a couple of minis that I'd already done, but I did one of them differently, one of them the same, and not much else to say there. Uh, I did a uh, Cador Warjack. This is it's Karchev the Terrible, which I remembered just as the page was loading up. So Karchev the Terrible, I am loving the red on this. This may be my favorite red painted model ever. And again, this is a result of using the um, War Colors paints. The red line, the five reds that they provide were the first colors that I really started to use from War Colors and have not regretted it since. Um, you can't do every red with it. It's really uh, more of the kind of orangey blood red, but within that constraint of orangey blood reds, uh, there's a lot of room to do uh, a lot of shades and a lot of different things with it. And this is, this, this made me happy. This red made me really happy. And so, kind of a highlight for my month, one of them. There's a, a, several highlights this month. Uh, so let's go take a look at what was next. So yeah, there was some more. Oh, okay, so really the beginning of the month was the end of one of my Kingdom Death Monster pinup Kickstarters, and then I did some more pinup Kickstarters. Uh, Kickstarters? Pinup miniatures. You know, when you have a, a, a game and miniatures that are closely associated with Kickstarter, I guess that's going to happen. <laughs> now, two in particular I want to point out here. Uh, the first is the Bard. The Bard is a really, truly beautiful piece. I don't even think it's it's listed in their pinups line. It's not really pinup-y. Um, really, she's dressed more like um, Lara Croft from the Tomb Raider series, um, except she's carrying a harp, is wearing a hat and has a cape. It's a, it, it's a really beautiful piece. Uh, the next one is the monk. And I think this one may be a pinup. I can't recall, honestly. Do it. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't call it a, a pinup, so maybe it wasn't part of the pinup line. Uh, but it's a really, I don't, I'm not sure I fully understand what's going on with this model, but uh, it does look really cool with her flaming fist thing. And really, the sculpt of the mini is, is what I like in particular. I wish I had a better pick of the, uh, of the base because I actually did some clear tones on it to make it look like she's standing at the edge of a kind of a tranquil pond. But, you know, what are you going to do? I wasn't thinking about it when I took the pictures. And then, of course, you know, more pinup-y things. And then I have this, the uh, Republic Malik from Alchemy Models. This is kind of a cat dude. Uh, I actually almost had a commission to do a whole bunch of these minis a while back, and then it, it never did work out. So I was happy to be able to do at least this one. I'm very happy with how it came out. They're resin. I never realized that. I thought they were I thought they were metal minis, but no, it's resin. It's pretty well cast, and uh, uh, it was fun to paint. Not a uh, not a not a difficult you know challenging piece or anything, but it was fun. I like doing animals and, and animal fur. Now, the big project for this month has been Mayal Drakkar, uh, which is 
Reaper's Five-Headed Dragon from the Bones line, which I guess was kind of their their signature piece on the last Bones Kickstarter. Uh, it's big. It's really big. Uh, <laughs> And if you can see from the pictures, actually, most of the pictures you can't tell, but I did manage to include a couple of pictures uh, that give a better sense of scale for the piece. It was a fun paint. Uh, I did not fully assemble it before painting it, knowing that because of the size, it would be easier if I could do it in smaller sub-assemblies. So what I ended up doing was uh, it, the heads, one of them is on the main body, and the other two are or the other four are two separate pieces of two heads each. So I added one of those two sets of heads to the body, left the other one off, painted those separately. I probably could have left them all off. Uh, the casting is such that it, it all fit pretty well in the end. So even the ones that went on afterwards, you couldn't really tell that they were necessarily separate pieces. Uh, even the wings, like the whole thing, I, I was very surprised at how it went together. The, the tail uh, had an additional piece at the end of the main body tail portion, required some cleanup and some, uh, some filling, but once that was done, couldn't tell. Couldn't tell there was anything there. Um, and yeah, so like I said, left the wings off to paint as well. and. I think that was really all I needed to do. I think everything that I put on needed to be on for the most part, except maybe those two heads and everything that was off, I was really happy that they were off. Um, Cause you know, the wings, each wing is like this big and the body is about this big. If I'd put the whole, when I actually did get the whole thing together to do final touch up and clear coating, you know, it was, it was a little unmanageable trying to maneuver the thing around. You know, though, one of the things I really like about the Bones models is they do really take the paint very well. Um, even though there was a couple of places where I was handling the miniature um, fairly often, usually right around kind of like the, uh, the stomach area, right above the legs, is where I would tend to put my fingers to hold the thing. And really it wasn't until the end that I noticed that the paint was wearing, but it wasn't coming off the model. It was wearing top down instead of bottom up, right? It wasn't, there's a storm going on. I don't know if you can hear the thunder, but I guess we're getting some uh, thunderstorms. Anyway, it wasn't like it was chipping off of the model. The paint wasn't chipping off. It was just abrading, you know, from being handled. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, I normally wear gloves. I know that you all see, see that I, I wear gloves all the time. That will help uh, when handling things like this because it's keeping the oils uh, off of the paint and the oils will kind of eat through the paint more than just just abrasion, so uh, something to keep in mind if you're going to be doing one of these yourself. But this took a while. You know, this was uh, this was most of was it most of my month? No, it wasn't most of the month, but it was a good chunk of it. Um, I think overall it took about a week, week and a half to do the whole thing. And then I ended my month uh, with a couple of Dragon Forge pieces, Dragon Forge, Hero Forge. I'm just making up names for things today. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> uh, but I got two. Uh, one of them is a sorcerer, and he's kind of shooting a little. I'd like to think of it as a magic missile, uh, but it looks like a magic arrow uh, from his hand. And the other is an orc, and I guess she's a druid who is an albino. Uh, but we went with a really, really pale green instead of just white. And I really love that figure. The, she's got a ton of character. And I continue to be impressed by what you can get out of the uh, Hero Forge um, creator. Uh, I've gone in several times and just created minis for fun, thinking, oh, maybe I'll, I'll get one for myself. But people keep sending me cool stuff to paint from that. And so I have never felt like I really need that thing. And since I'm not playing role-playing games, that would be the ideal thing to go, oh, I'm going to make my character. It's kind of what it's for. And I just haven't gotten to it yet. Um, 
I'd also considered doing it for Rogue Star, which the last time I made a character on there, I was like, maybe I'll make a Rogue Star mini. But I didn't. So, but speaking of that, uh, as I said, this was kind of a, a light month on for quantity of minis. But it also has been a light month for gaming, at least in terms of tabletop gaming, and I haven't really gotten any done. But I have gotten some painting done for tabletop minis, and specifically, and I kind of skipped over these here because these were in in amongst the uh, the other things. Is I did uh, Chipster, which is kind of a, a a dog guy in powered armor. And I did uh, Rogue Drax, which is kind of a sci-fi guy with his sword and, and rifle. And both super good. I mean, I, I actually talked about these. If you saw my uh, hassle-free spotlight, I went on and on about how much I like hassle-free minis. And so I probably don't need to go on much more here. But the whole point of this is that although I didn't actually play any tabletop games, uh, I was thinking about and working on stuff for my own tabletop gaming purposes. So it's not like I didn't do anything for myself. I, I did a little bit. And then on top of that, I got my new computer. And so I'm playing a lot of video games. Uh, really, I was only playing one for a while. I was playing, and even then, not that much. Uh, PUBG, uh, Player Unknown Battleground. Uh, if you don't know what it is, and I think I mentioned it last month, but if you don't know what it is, it's a shooter, uh, multiplayer with a lot of people. Think Hunger Games, because you're all fighting to be the last survivor or the last team survivors. And it is, it's a thing, you know. Uh, there are a lot of ways to play it, and probably your best method for uh, survival, at least through most of the game, is just avoiding everybody. And just think about in a game that's a shooter where one of the best strategies is just to avoid people. That's, um, that's weird. <laughs> it's very strange. I mean, you don't have to. You could get involved in firefights, but it does tend to decrease your possibility of survival. So, uh, that's, that's, it's weird. I have sort of this weird love-hate relationship with that game. Um, on the other hand, uh, <laughs> and this is funny, while I was watching um, Will Smith from Tested.com, or formerly of Tested.com, play PUBG, because I spend far more time watching other people play the game than I do playing it myself, he mentioned in passing that he thought that Shadow of Mordor was an amazing game. And I went, Shadow of Mordor? what is this? And I looked it up online and discovered that it was a part of the Steam sale and I could, it could be had for five bucks. And I went, but he says it's amazing. I'll just buy it. So I bought it. And, and that has been my obsession ever since. Uh, it is super fun. Uh, Shadow of Mordor is essentially, you, you play a, uh, a, a ranger stuck in kind of the twilight realm uh, you know sort of like where the ring wraiths kind of live uh, and more specifically you're stuck in Mordor which is where the ring wraiths live uh, and you are trying to remove your curse you and uh, an elf who is also kind of stuck in the same situation and you run around Mordor uh, shanking orcs I mean, that's, in a nutshell, that's what you do. You run around Mordor shanking orcs, and it is super fun. It's almost like a fighting game in a semi-open world uh, in Middle-earth, or Mordor specifically, and it's, it's great. And that I have been putting some hours into in my evenings. So that's kind of where the only gaming I've done recently. I'm pretty close to just going ahead and doing some videos of my video gaming, my evening video gaming. Part of the problem, I re part of the reason I haven't done it is that uh, I'm not really set up to do it yet on that computer. All of the tools that I had for doing that kind of stuff were on the computer that I use in the shop now. Uh, I just need to get it set up, and then I'll I'll probably be making some videos. 
So that's kind of it for gaming. So I wanted to talk about a couple of Kickstarters today. Um, one that's a modest Kickstarter and one that is not. <laughs> All right, so the first one is called Epic Dungeon Tiles Fantasy Tiles for 3D Printers. And uh, it is, well, it's, it's dungeon tiles. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So what I like about this is that if you've ever actually used the dungeon tiles that have uh, walls, they look awesome, like your Dwarven Forge and what have you. They look amazing when you get them out on the table. They are problematic in actual play. You can't always see your guys. Maneuvering them around doesn't always work so well. Um, they, they can create issues. Uh, what this has done has, they've decided that it's going to be just the tiles, doors, and some other things that are kind of freestanding, but the tiles themselves are just the floor. So you don't have to worry about the constraints of having the walls. And it's real straightforward, and, and I think the idea here is that you can just, you know, quickly set them up, quickly tear them down, throw them in a bin uh, to store until your next game. And on the one hand, looks much better than a dungeon drawn on a piece of uh, vinyl with an overhead projector pen. And on the other hand, doesn't have some of the issues that you get with having dungeon walls in addition to your floors. Uh, and then of course it has doors and some uh, uh, statues and things like that, pillars that you can add to sort of dress it up some. And, but what I really like uh, are the traps. He's designed some cool little trap tiles to go with the uh, to go with the other tiles. Now, I have actually printed some myself, and we'll dive in here in a second and take a look. And they are really cool. They're real straightforward. The basic dungeon tile is like four blocks of uh, 25 millimeter, um, like flagstones. Real simple, but you've got these other traps that are <laughs> super fun. I've got a, I've got a locked uh, pit trap and a, uh, so what do they call it here? Circular saw trap very cool but in addition to that they've got a crunching blade and a uh, a cage trap poison darts spiked pit swinging mace all kinds of these cool little guys and uh, it's very fun stuff and the ones that I got um, as as samples Printed out really well, really quickly. Like you could punch out a bunch of these things in no time at all. And with a little paint, you know, like I have, so I have some here and they are primed and not primed. So I've got the white uh, ABS that I've been using for everything recently and I've got these primed gray. And they look, they look really good. It wouldn't take much to make them look great. So definitely got that going for it. And it's not expensive at all. So the basic pledge is uh, five pounds, which is about six dollars, Kickstarter tells me. Uh, and that essentially gets you all of your basic floors, the door and door frame, pillar and statue. So you don't really need much more than that, but if you want the traps, uh, you can get those for an additional five. Or really, you get the whole thing. You can get, so you can get the traps on their own, you can get the, the tiles on their own, or you can get the whole thing for eight pounds, which for me is 10 bucks. That's, that's super good. 
Have I mentioned? Yeah, I, I, get, I did mention these are all 3D printable, right? I did start that. I don't think I started with that. I hope I hope that you got the uh, idea, especially from looking at the um, <laughs> looking at the Kickstarter here. Um, in any case, it's not a lot of money, and if you got a 3D printer, these are really cool. The other thing that's really nice about it is that they will be compatible with OpenLock, which is the same system that uh, 3D printable 3D print 3D printable scenery. What are they called? 3D printablescenery.com. That's what it is. <laughs> so what's printablescenery.com uses, and printablescenery.com has sort of become the kind of the big guy in terms of um, online purchasable uh, 3D printable terrain. So uh, they're utilizing the same system that they have, so it'll give you more to use there. Or if you buy this and you're thinking, well, I want to expand on it, it gives you a direction to go. So that's pretty fantastic as well. And I didn't even mention they have some other cool um, uh, stretch goals, uh, like the observatory, fountain, bear trap, some stairs, flooded tiles. I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff here to um, really fill out your dungeon with things. And so I just thought I'd go ahead and share that one with you. Now, the other one I wanted to mention doesn't really need my help at all, but I am a fan. Uh, so the other one is Blood and Plunder, No Peace Beyond the Line. And this is the first uh, expansion for the Blood and Plunder game, which I love. Uh, that game is amazing. It's really incredibly well done. Uh, and I have not played it enough yet, nor have I painted enough of the minis. Actually, I've been meaning to pull them out of the case and put them on the bench here so that it, as, so I can have a reminder that I actually really want to paint them. Uh, but with this expansion, they've added more ships. They've added more um, uh, factions. So now you can get uh, the Dutch. They've got uh, Native Caribbeans, which I really want. Those are super cool. Um, Pirates and Privateers, as well as some European land forces. And then all kinds of like little, little extra add-ons that you can get in addition. And now they've got a, like a canoe, a paragua, the flute, Flute? Fluit? Uh, and a galleon uh, in terms of the waterborne craft that they have as additionals. They have more commanders, some casualty markers. Uh, I mean, it's all really good. I was super thrilled with the original Blood and Plunder Kickstarter. And like I said, I think it's a great game. If I have a complaint, and I do, um, it is that while the miniatures are fine, they are merely fine. They are not great. Uh, the designs are cool. I think my biggest issue with them is that the the detail is a little shallow. And so they remind me of like good historical minis back when historical minis were kind of shitty. <laughs> but, but every now and then you get get one that was like, oh, that's pretty good for a historical mini. Well, that's kind of what this is like. It's kind of good for a historical mini. Uh, actually, they're really good for historical minis, but when you compare them to the fantasy and sci-fi offerings that are available today, they don't compare that well, but it's okay. I mean, like, the only reason I complain at all is because the, the, the minis themselves are what tends to drive my interest in painting them. So if I look at a mini and I go, Oh God, that's amazing. I really want to paint this. Great. You know, like I'm motivated and I go, but if I look at a mini and I go, Hmm, that's okay. The motivation to paint isn't always there. So, uh, it's the fact that it's a great game. It's a period I like, uh, I love the way they've, they've gone about in making a 
you know, relatively historical accurate game for pirates. So uh, take a look at that, especially if you had not looked at Blood and Plunder before, this may be a time to go ahead and jump in and get going. But I think that's going to hit it for Kickstarters for now. So I think that's going to do it for today's discussions. Uh, I've been pretty happy with my ability to get videos done this month. I think this may actually make four videos and I have another one that I want to squeeze in. Um, this is a box of goodies from Spellcrow in Poland. And they just asked if I wanted to take a look at some of their stuff and perhaps uh, talk about it online. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to do another uh, manufacturer spotlight. Let me give you a hint. Their stuff is amazing. And I'm super excited about it. <laughs> Very happy that they were willing to send me goodies to look at. Uh, if other manufacturers are watching this and thinking, hey, maybe I should contact him about sending him stuff and maybe he'll talk about it nicely. Send me an email. You never know. Um, the truth is, though, if it's not something I'm excited about, I probably won't want to do it because why waste your time and my time if all I'm going to do is be unhappy? So, but definitely shoot me an email, jayadon at gmail.com, and let me know. But that's going to do it for now. Thank you for watching again, and uh, I will talk to you all later. Bye.